Doctor. So hi, everybody. My name is Gene Bowman. I'm the clinical trials director at the McCann Center uh, for Brain Health. And uh, we have a speaker today, Dr. Kyoko Konishi, who received her PhD in neuroscience from McGill University. Uh, she completed her postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Jill Goldstein at the Brigham um, and was an NIA-supported T32 fellow in the Harvard Translational Research and Aging Training Program. Um, she's currently an instructor in the Department of Psychiatry here at Mass General and a recent recipient of a K01 award. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and she's also a former K12, uh, I won't go through all these, these acronyms, but a scholar awardee. Um, Dr. Kanishi's research focuses on sex differences in Alzheimer's disease and the mediating role of mitochondrial function. Uh, she has a specific interest in estradiol regulation of mitochondrial function and its impact on memory circuitry changes in women as they transition through menopause and further the long-term implications for risk in Alzheimer's disease. Today, she will present sex differences in risk for Alzheimer's disease, the role of mitochondrial function. Welcome, Dr. Konishi. Thank you, Dr. Bowman, for the introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here today and to present some of our work. Um, so, you know, I thought I'd first kind of start this talk by just, you know, introducing sex differences in Alzheimer's disease um, and presenting some of our earlier work in this area and some of the key, uh, you know, findings in the field. Um, and then I thought, you know, this would be a great opportunity to kind of uh, present findings from one of our main collaborations with the McCann Center um, called the Healthy Aging Translational Cohort Study. Um, so we just actually recently finished data collection for this study last year and just started some analyses. So, you know, I'm really, I thought it would be fun to kind of present some of those results. Um, and then lastly, um, I'll present some findings from an area of research that's of a particular interest of mine, which is the role of mitochondrial function in understanding uh, sex differences in Alzheimer's. So, um, all right, I'll jump right in. So, um, you know, it's well known that, you know, with an increasingly aging population, um, you know, the, the prevalence or the incidence of Alzheimer's disease is rapidly increasing, becoming, you know, one of the biggest public health priorities. And by 2050, about 13.8, we're expecting about 13.8 million cases of Alzheimer's. But um, what's less well known is that Alzheimer's actually disproportionately affects women with about two thirds of cases being in women. And while this is partially attributable to differences in life expectancy rates with women living longer than men, um, there are other sex specific and sex dependent genetic and physiological factors that contribute to these sex differences. And in fact, when we look at the clinical manifestation of Alzheimer's disease, we do indu indeed see sex differences. So for example, when we look at women who are E4 carriers, so APOE4 being one of the main genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's, we see that women who are E4 carriers have increased tau pathology, decreased connectivity in memory circuitry regions, increased brain hypometabolism, increased brain atrophy, as well as accelerated cellular aging in the form of uh, shorter leukocyte telomere lengths. Um, when we look at women who are amyloid positive, we find that they have increased neurodegeneration as well as increased cognitive decline. And then finally, when we look at women who have Alzheimer's disease, we, we see that they have greater tau pathology in the brain. And also the pathology that we do see in the brain is more highly related to clinical symptoms um, in these patients. And so, you know, overall, there are significant sex differences in Alzheimer's pathology for which, you know, really the underlying pathophysiology is not really well understood. And so when we think about AD pathology, you know, we now know that there's a preclinical phase to the disease when, you know, there's asymptomatic accumulation of the pathology, which starts about 15 to 20 years prior to clinical diagnosis. And this includes increased amyloid, increased tau, increased neurodegeneration, as well as decreased glucose metabolism, which is partially due to decline in mitochondrial function. And again, all of this starts about 15 to 20 years prior to clinical diagnosis, which really puts us at midlife. And so for this reason, you know, there's a lot of emphasis now in AD research for the early detection prevention of the disease in midlife. But when thinking about midlife, sex differences are really important because men and women undergo different aging processes in midlife. So women, they not only undergo chronological aging, but they also undergo reproductive aging in the form of menopause. And the average age of menopause being 51, which really kind of puts us in that window of 15 to 20 years prior to, clinic, um, to clinical diagnosis. 
And so during menopause, you know, women, they experience a decline of ovarian hormones, including estradiol. And this is really important because estradiol is really a master regulator of many neurological processes. So there are estrogen receptors distributed within a vast array of neural circuits um, that are really the neurological basis for a lot of the symptoms that we see that emerge during perimenopause. So for example, estradiol can regulate temperature, sleep, energy, balance, food intake, emotion regulation. And the two that, are, uh, that we're particularly interested in is the memory circuitry function as well as metabolic function. And and mitochondrial function. And so um, to kind of give a little background on mitochondria, um, so, you know, mitochondria are known as the, the powerhouses of the cells. You know, one of the, they're the main source of bioenergetics, and one of their main functions is to convert glucose to ATP through the process of cellular respiration. And all cells, including neurons, need energy in the form of ATP in order to function. Um, and a primary source of that energy is glucose. So just to kind of briefly go through this, you know, glucose is transported to the mitochondria and through a process of glycolysis is converted to pyruvate. And then pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA, which then goes to the TCA cycle, releasing NADH and FADH, which are the main electron or proton carriers. And then they travel to the electron transport chain, which is embedded within the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And here they deposit the electrons, which travel through the electron transport chain and essentially pumping these protons into this inner membrane space, creating this proton gradient. And this eventually, you know, travels back into the matrix through complex five, which is ATP synthase. And this powers complex five to convert ADP to ATP. And this is essentially how you get ATP. And through this process, you also get the production of reactive oxygen species, which are normally neutralized to water, but then when they're not, they can then lead to damage of membrane and, and DNA, and essentially leading to what we know as this oxidative stress. And so the reason I talk about this is because estradiol is really, you know, important in regulating mitochondrial function. So estradiol increases the protein expression of different metabolic and uh, mitochondrial enzymes, including enzymes that are involved in glucose transport and glycolysis, the TCA cycle, as well as oxidative phosphorylation. So these include enzymes like pyruvate dehydrogenase, aconitase, ATP synthase. Um, and so ultimately, estradiol really upregulates mitochondrial respiration. And on top of that, estradiol also reduces the formation of reactive oxygen species and therefore has antioxidant properties or effects as well. And so you can imagine with menopause and the decline of estradiol, this can have an impact on glucose metabolism. And indeed, we see about you know, 15 to 20% decrease in cerebral glucose metabolism mitochondrial function over menopause, which in turn can then have a large impact on neurological processes and potentially presenting menopause as a window of vulnerability in, in women that differ from men. And so, you know, over the past many years, um, my mentor, Dr. Jill Goldstein, has done a lot of research in this area, understanding, you know, menopause as a window of vulnerability and changes in cognitive function and brain function that occur over the menopausal transition. And so one of these studies uh, looked at um, women in various stages of menopause, and this was done with her trainee, uh, Dr. Emily Jacobs at the time. And so she looked at pre, peri, and postmenopausal women and men and age matched men. And something that's important to note here is that these are all age matched um, for chronological age, but they just differ in reproductive age. And so these individuals were tested on uh, two different types of memory tests, uh, one being a verbal memory test and one being an associative memory test. And uh, something to note here is, you know, from post puberty. Uh, into adulthood, there's, uh, women or females have always shown advantage on verbal memory tests. Um, so this is something, you know, that's been replicated many times in the literature. Females always show an advantage on verbal memory tests. However, what the study showed was that actually in postmenopausal women or in postmenopause, women actually lose this female advantage. And you can see here that postmenopausal women perform significantly worse than pre-perimenopausal women and actually look more similar to men. And so over this menopausal transition, they lose this female advantage. And next, when they looked at the functional activity in the brain during different memory tasks, um, so in this case, this was a verbal encoding task that typically shows, you know, increased activity in the hippocampus. As you can see here nicely in the pre- and perimenopausal women, you know, showing increased activity during a verbal encoding. However, when they looked at the postmenopausal women, they showed this drastic lower levels of activity in the hippocampus and actually look closer to men. 
So not only do they have worse memory performance, but they also have lower activity in the hippocampus during verbal encoding. Um, what's interesting was that when they looked at connectivity in the brain, they actually found that postmenopausal women had increased bilateral connectivity between the left and the right hippocampus. So it wasn't just that they were showing lower activity in the hippocampus, but they were actually recruiting bilateral hippocampus almost as a compensatory mechanism in order to maintain performance. And this was also seen when they looked at another task, uh, a working memory task of this time. Um, and this working memory task typically shows a disengagement of the hippocampus and increased activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So here, you know, you can see uh, kind of the typical pattern of what you would see during this task where you see a disengagement of the hippocampus. However, what you see in postmenopausal women is that this failure to disengage uh, the hippocampus during this task. And I think this is important because it shows that, you know, we're not just seeing an overall decrease in hippocampal or brain function in general um, in postmenopause, but really it's kind of this neural inefficiency in the memory circuitry, uh, depending on the task itself. Um, and they almost kind of see this compensatory mechanism in postmenopausal women. And um, of course, you know, we're not the only study or lab that has looked at changes over menopause. Um, there's been a lot of great work that's been done by uh, the group Lisa Moscone and uh, Roberta Britton in this area. And they specifically, uh, one of their studies, looked at glucose metabolism over the menopausal transition. And they looked, um, and what they found was that um, over menopause, so comparing pre and peri uh, to postmenopausal women, they show this uh, really like drastic decrease in glucose metabolism in all these areas of the temporal cortex, the uh, posterior cingulate, the precuneus, um, and the frontal cortex. And in fact, when they looked, and all of these analyses were also controlled for chronological age, so this is really due just to um, reproductive aging. Um, when they compared uh, these results to age-matched men, and uh, in this study, they actually looked at, they compared asymptomatic and, and uh, symptomatic perimenopausal women, symptoms being things like hot flashes, mood swings, insomnia, changes in appetite. Um, what they found was that, you know, when they looked at glucose metabolism, um, there wasn't much of a difference between the asymptomatic perimenopausal women and men. Um, there was more of a difference between perimenopause and men, who were, or perimenopausal women who were symptomatic, uh, but really the biggest difference was between those um, that were post-menopause and men in terms of glucose metabolism. So we are definitely seeing this decrease in glucose metabolism over the menopausal transition. Um, the same group also looked at brain volume, uh, both gray and white matter volumes in AD vulnerable brain regions. Um, and similarly, they found, you know, when they compared to age match men, postmenopausal women showed the biggest difference in regional volumes um, in both gray and white matter volumes. And this include regions like, again, the posterior cingulate, the temporal, uh, the frontal and the parietal regions. And then lastly, also from this group, um, they also looked at amyloid deposition across menopause, and similarly, they found that, you know, over the menopausal transition, there's this increase in amyloid deposition, specifically in postmenopausal women, um, even though, you know, again, these are all groups that are masked, uh, that are controlled for chronological age. And so, you know, to summarize these findings, um, really, you know, I hope this demonstrates that there are significant sex differences in Alzheimer's disease. And overall, uh, over the menopausal transition, you know, we see this decreased glucose metabolism, this decreased memory performance, um, altered memory circuitry function and connectivity, uh, decreased volume in brain and AD vulnerable brain regions, and increased amyloid deposition, which really seems to suggest of evidence um, that menopause really is a period of vulnerability in women. And this is actually very timely because I think there was a recent article that just came out from Harvard showing that, you know, over 99% of studies in aging do not take into consideration menopause or menopausal staging, um, even though, you know, we do see all of these major changes in the brain in women during this really critical time. And so, you know, our lab is really focused on, you know, this period of midlife and studying sex difference and the risk for Alzheimer's disease and it, in order to identify early those who may be at highest risk. Um, which leads us into, you know, this next study, uh, there's just called the Healthy Aging Translational Cohort. So like I mentioned, um, Hatch is, you know, a project that we're actually doing in collaboration with the McCann Center. And uh, it was also funded by the Bright Focus Foundation and the John Sperling Foundation. Um, and the goal of this study was really to develop a risk algorithm that will identify in midlife those at highest risk for Alzheimer's disease um, prior to disease manifestation that really differs by sex. 
And so to break that down a little bit, um, so Hatch and, and the Hatch study, we recruited subjects from the MGB Biobank. Um, so anybody who receives care within the MGB system um, is invited to join the biobank. And if they agree, then they donate a blood sample, which is then used for genotyping. And then the genetic information is then linked to their medical records. And anybody who's affiliated with uh, the MGB biobank can use the, the biobank portal to kind of find, you know, ideal candidates either for their clinical trials or the research studies. Um, so that's exactly what we did. We recruited uh, subjects who were between the ages of 50 and 70 who are healthy adults. So no, no, nobody with cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. Um, but we recruited, you know, 50 women and we did have 50 men, but we had to exclude one male because his data was unreliable. Um, but the overall goal sample was uh, 100 subjects and we recruited 50 high risk and low risk subjects. So we define those as high risk, um, as those that have high genetic risk. So um, the ApoE4 allele, one or two copies of the E4 allele, and one or more clinical risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, um, including hypertension, type two diabetes, and major depressive disorder. And then the low risk subjects uh, did not have genetic risk or any of these clinical risk factors. Um, and again, they're between 50 and 70. And these are all, you know, healthy adults uh, that do not have cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's diagnosis. So we brought in 100 subjects, um, high and low risk, to do kind of a deep phenotyping protocol where we looked at these various measures of, you know, neurovascular function, cognitive, structural, functional, clinical, metabolic, genetic, immune, and hormonal. And ultimately, our goal is to take all of this information that we're collecting in order to create this clinical risk algorithm for Alzheimer's disease in midlife um, and use this uh, algorithm to and validate this algorithm using uh, PET amylate imaging. And of course, everything we do um, is by sex as well. So as part of this protocol, we uh, collected, you know, um, a series that, or a battery of neuropsychological assessments uh, in memory measures, executive function, verbal memory, uh, verbal IQ. Um, and we also did a pretty extensive neuroimaging protocol where we collected structural scans, um, functional scan, functional MRI scans. So in the scanner, they completed two different types of memory tasks. Uh, we did resting state, uh, diffusion MRI. We also did retinal imaging, um, as well as uh, amyloid imaging using C11 PIB. Uh, we also have a lot of blood samples that were collected from these uh, subjects to do a lot of different assays. Um, so of course, you know, we're particularly interested in hormones. So we have a lot of pituitary, gonadal, and adrenal hormone data. We um, collected a lot of metabolic analytes uh, as well. We'll be looking at blood-based biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Um, immune profiling. So this is done in collaboration with Dr. Tanuja Chitnis um, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, so we plan to do transcriptomics and proteomics, um, and then also using the genetic information that's available from the biobank, of course, in collaboration with Dr. Tanzi and Dimitri Popenko. So um, the reason I'm showing all this is because we have this ton of data in the Hatch study, you know, and we're just starting to get into this data. Um, and so, you know, if anybody is interested in kind of, help, you know, exploring some of these data with us or, you know, has any ideas, you know, we're always happy to, to chat. So I just kind of wanted to give, you know, an overall um, introduction of what kind of data we have available in this study. Um, all right. So like I said, you know, we've just started analyzing these results. And uh, so far, you know, in preliminary analyses, we've started just, you know, by comparing, you know, our initial definition of high risk and low risk subjects. And so high risk, again, being those with genetic and clinical risk factors. And what we found was that, you know, when we looked at the cognitive assessments, and here I'm just showing associative memory, but this was really true across the board for all of the cognitive measures that we acquired. Um, High-risk individuals performed significantly worse on all of the cognitive assessment measures that we uh, administered um, compared to low risk, both in men and women. And again, these are, these are healthy subjects, though. They're not subjects with cognitive impairment. Um, and then when we looked at kind of a cumulative risk score, where we looked at, you know, what is the additive impact of clinical risk factors? So those that have, you know, uh, one or more clinical risk factors in addition to the genetic risk, you know, how do they perform? And sure enough, we see that those with more clinical risk factors perform significantly worse uh, compared to those with less. 
And then uh, we also looked at, uh, we started looking at the retinal imaging data. Um, so the retinal vasculature, um, the retinal vascular system um, is highly isolated like the brain, and it actually shares many morphometric and physiological properties with the cerebral vascular system. And so this is why, you know, the retinal vasculature was really an, of interest for us to look at, to start to get an idea of, you know, these differences in um, the neurovascular system. And so two of the measures that we looked at were uh, the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer and vascular density. And what was really interesting was that when we compared high and low risk individuals, uh, we found that, you know, high risk individuals did indeed have thinner retinal, retinal nerve fiber layer and less vascular density compared to the low risk individuals. Um, and then, you know, when we looked at the amyloid pathology was really, really kind of, you know, was our ultimate uh, validating factor, we do indeed see that high risk individuals have significantly more amyloid deposition compared to low risk. Um, and even using the cutoff of 1.2, dichotomizing those in two who are amyloid positive and negative, we found that 35% of high-risk subjects met the criteria for amyloid positive, again, healthy subjects, um, they met the criteria for amyloid positive uh, compared to only one subject that met that criteria and the low risk group. Um, and while, you know, we didn't have the sample size to be able to kind of do uh, sex interaction analysis or have, you know, be able to pull out any sex differences, it does seem like, you know, there are a higher portion of women who might be more, uh, who might be more amyloid positive, um, but this is something, you know, that we're gonna explore more um, as we increase the data or the, the, the sample size, sorry. And uh, so next, you know, um, our postdoc, Dylan Svetz, uh, she was really interested in looking at the default mode network connectivity um, in uh, these individuals. And really interesting is that she found, you know, a significant interaction between sex and uh, risk status on the default mode network connectivity. So the default mode network is, you know, your, your brain connection at rest. And what she found was that, you know, the significant interaction that was primarily driven by women, where, um, you know, she found that high-risk women has significantly lower connectivity within the default mode network compared to those that are low risk. And this is primarily driven by connections between the posterior cingulate cortex and the left and right hippocampus. And uh, in fact, you know, alterations in the default mode network recently have been kind of proposed actually as a biomarker for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, we also picked it up when we were comparing high risk and low risk individuals. And in fact, you know, this connection in females, uh, when we looked at how this related to cognitive function, we found that specifically in women, higher uh, DMN within network connectivity was related to better associative memory performance and also, uh, lower amyloid pathology. So those with lower connectivity within the default mode network had worse, um, had more uh, amyloid pathology in the brain. And, uh, and lastly, um, when we looked at um, those, uh, when we looked at functional connectivity in the brain uh, during a um, a working memory task. So if you recall, you know, um, this is a working memory task. It's called the TUBAC, um, where we show a series of letters and the subjects have to indicate whether the letter that they see on the screen is the same as a letter that they saw to previously. And so this task typically shows uh, a deactivation or disengagement of the hippocampus, as you can see in most of the groups. However, specifically in the high risk post uh, high risk women, um, we see this, this failure to disengage similar to what we saw earlier in postmenopausal women as a group on this task, um, which seems to suggest that, you know, overall, it may be, you know, the high risk women within that group, because these are all postmenopausal women, um, it may be the high risk women in that group that was showing the, uh, the greatest failure to disengage during working memory. And so, you know, overall, um, uh, we do see uh, when we just, you know, simply compare high risk and low risk, we do see that high risk show worse memory performance, decreased um, retinal nerve fiber layer than, and uh, less vascular density, uh, increased amyloid, um, decreased connectivity within the default mode network, specifically in women, and also altered memory circuitry function. Uh, suggesting that, you know, in cognitively healthy adults, uh, high risk based on genetic and clinical risk is associated with early AD-related pathology. And like I said, you know, we're just 
getting into these data. So if people have ideas, you know, we're always happy to, to chat about this. Um, but, you know, the so Hatch study initially included 100 subjects. But, you know, as I said in the beginning, ultimately, the goal for Hatch was, you know, to develop this clinical risk algorithm using all of this deep phenotyping information that, you know, that we're collecting. And so, um, we were lucky to be funded uh, by NIA um, to continue this study, to do kind of a phase two of this study that we're calling the HATCH-2 study. And in HATCH-2, we're actually uh, bringing back the same 100 subjects that we brought, that we had in um, HATCH-1 uh, as a five-year follow-up. But we were also funded to recruit an additional um, 124 high-risk and low-risk subjects in this study. So uh, in Hatch 2, um, we our subjects are now going to be 50 to 75 years old. The total sample, you know, we'll be able to now more than double our original sample, which is really exciting. Um, and we'll have, you know, uh, of course, equal number of men and women. Um, but this time we're doing something a little bit different, where we're actually having three groups of high risk uh, groups. So we'll have our original genetic and cardiometabolic disease group. Um, but in addition, we're planning to recruit one group that's just cardiometabolic disease and one group that's only genetic risk. And this is actually an idea that was, you know, brought up by Dr. Tanzi <laughs> um, and a comment that he made, you know, can you kind of isolate the impact of these? Um, and so, you know, we thought that was a great idea. And uh, in Hatch 2, we decided to kind of create these three genetic groups to kind of look at, you know, both the individual effects, but also the additive um, impact of cardiometabolic disease in addition to genetic risk. Um, so now we have these eight groups. Um, again, our low risk is the same with no genetic or clinical risk um, factors. And so we are really, you know, just in the midst of data collection for this study. So hopefully in a few years, we'll have some, you know, exciting results to, to present to everyone. Um, but an additional component of Hatch 2 that we're very excited about is that we're also doing uh, 7T imaging. So we're doing high resolution imaging really to get to the microvasculature um, and the 7T will allow us to uncover small vessels that are not uh, visible with the 3T and, and females, you know, uh, cardiovascular disease is really a, sm a small vessel disease. Um, so this will be really important for us to really get, you know, at sex differences in the neurovasculature of the brain um, using 7T imaging. And this will be in collaboration with, this is in collaboration with Dr. Palameni, Dr. Garcia, um, as well as our lab. All right, so for the last part of my talk, um, I'd like to, you know, present some more uh, da recent data kind of on the role of mitochondrial function. Um, so, you know, like, you know, like was included in the introduction, um, so my research focuses on metabolic mediators of sex differences in Alzheimer's disease um, with a specific interest in estradiol regulation of mitochondrial function. Um, and I presented a lot of this background in the beginning, um, but, you know, I am interested in estradiol regulation of mitochondrial function, how this impacts uh, women and memory circuitry in the brain and AD pathology um, in women as they transition through menopause and ultimately really the long-term implications for Alzheimer's disease risk. So to start, you know, looking at this, uh, we used cells that were collected in the Hatch study. So we had collected PBMCs um, in the larger Hatch study. And so we isolated monocytes from uh, the PBMCs and used the Seahorse uh, excess cell mitosis stress test kit. So this is a really great kit because it really gives you kind of uh, information on the functional dynamics of uh, mitochondrial respiration, and it gives you uh, measures across the various states. So um, just to kind of briefly go through this, you know, the first measure that you get is basal respiration, and this is all measured as an oxygen consumption rate. And you can think of basal, rep uh, basal respiration as, you know, kind of the baseline mitochondrial function um, in the absence of any stressors. And then in the next step, uh, oligomycin is administered, and this essentially uh, um, stops the activity of complex five um, and uh, doesn't allow any proton flux through complex five. Um, and then so you'll get a drop in oxygen consumption rate, which is solely linked to ATP linked respiration. And then any cons oxygen consumption rate that remains is attributed to uh, the proton leak. So, for example, a leaky membrane. 
Um, and then in the next step, HCCP is administered, and this essentially abolishes uh, the, the proton gradient um, and allows for an unlimited flow of electrons through the electron transport chain, um, thus you know, significantly increasing the oxygen consumption rate and giving you a measure of uh, maximal respiration. And you can think of you know, maximal respiration as the capacity of your mitochondria to utilize oxygen um, during you know, maximum energy demand states or during states of stress. And then finally, um, all mitochondrial related oxygen consumption are all um, is abolished um, and you get this drastic decrease and anything that's remaining is uh, non mitochondrial. And then also um, the difference of the maximal respiration to the basal respiration is what oh, sorry, um, is known as called the spare capacity. Um, and this is, you know, how much your cells can increase its oxygen consumption rate in the presence of a stressor. So it gives you these really nice measures across these various states of, of mitochondrial respiration. Um, so, you know, um, so we decided, you know, to take these measures and, you know, relate them to see how they relate to our cognitive and brain measures. And, you know, well, we're fully aware that, you know, these are these are peripheral measures. So there's, of course, there's limitations, you know, to looking at peripheral measures. Um, and down the road, you know, I do hope to kind of look at more direct brain measures of, you know, glucose metabolism, mitochondrial function. Um, there was a nice study that came out from, again, Lisa Moscone, Roberta Britton's group, where they looked at peripheral measure of mitochondrial function. Um, in this case, they looked at cytochrome oxidative uh, activity, so COX, uh, medical mitochondrial COX activity. And they found, uh, they related this to brain glucose metabolism using FDG PET. And they did actually find both in the frontal cortex and the temporal cortex, a nice relationship between this peripheral measure of mitochondrial function in pre and perimenopausal women and to a certain extent in, um, as a, in peri and postmenopausal women and to a certain extent um, in premenopausal women. So this is really nice and gave us confidence to kind of proceed with the analyses to look at, you know, our peripheral measures of mitochondrial function in relation to uh, the brain outcomes. So, you know, first we looked at, you know, is there a difference between men and women in terms of these mitochondrial measures? Um, and overall, we found, you know, looking at the means and also kind of comparing them, we found that there was actually no sex difference in terms of the actual cellular respiration uh, rates or oxygen consumption rates um, within these different states between men and women. And so then we looked at, next we looked at, you know, how does this relate to the brain and cognitive function? So first we looked at basal respiration, uh, which you know, if you recall, is kind of like the baseline measure. And uh, and what we found was that, you know, across the board on all of the verbal memory measures that we looked at, you know, basal respiration was actually pretty highly related to uh, verbal memory performance um, in the total group. And when we stratified this by sex, um, we found that, you know, especially in women and to a lesser extent in males, overall, you know, basal, higher basal respiration was related to better verbal memory performance. And so this is really nice to see. And these analyses we controlled for age, uh, play, marital status, um, and education. And, uh, and so then we looked at, uh, so as part of this study, you know, we also did a lot of neuroimaging. Um, and one of the tasks that the subjects did in the scanner was a verbal encoding test. So uh, in this task, there was an encoding and a retrieval phase. So during the encoding phase, they're showing two words um, and they have to form a sentence in their mind using those two words. And then there's a retrieval phase where they're showing uh, single words and they have to indicate whether they've seen these words previously during the encoding phase. And this task typically shows, you know, increased activity in the um, in the hippocampus. And as I demonstrated earlier, the postmenopausal women tend to show lower activity in the hippocampus compared to pre-perimenopausal women. So then we were interested to see, you know, well, how does this relate to basal respiration? And what we found was that overall in the total group, basal best respiration was indeed related to activity in the right hippocampus, uh, which when stratified by sex, we found was that primarily driven by uh, women. And in fact, there were significant sex differences in both the right hippocampus, as well as the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, um, which is also another region that shows increased activity uh, during verbal encoding. And you can see here nicely that, you know, higher basal respiration in women was related to increased activity in the right hippocampus. 
So, you know, just looking at basal respiration, it really provided, you know, this nice kind of almost proof of concept that indeed, you know, our, our, these measures of uh, cellular respiration were indeed related to memory performance um, and healthy midlife men and women, um, as well as functional activity in the memory circuitry in women. And uh, further, you know, keeping in mind that this is a Hatch cohort and we have high risk and low risk subjects, um, we did some analyses looking, you know, by, by risk status. And what we found um, when we looked at amyloid pathology was that specifically in the high risk women, um, higher, uh, higher basal respiration was related to lower amyloid pathology, um, suggesting that, you know, high risk women with lower basal respiration may be at particularly high risk for Alzheimer's disease. All right, so then um, in our next set of analyses, we moved on to ATP linked respiration. Um, and, you know, a key component of mitochondrial function is the ability to produce ATP uh, from glucose. And when we looked at ATP-linked respiration, we found that effects were only in women. So only in women, higher ATP-linked respiration was related to better verbal memory, again, across the board on all of the measures that we looked at. Um, and then similarly, when we looked in the brain, fun and brain function, again, we found specifically only in women, higher ATP-linked respiration was related to increased activity in the right hippocampus, as well as the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, and they differed significantly from men. So, you know, this kind of raised the question of well, why in ATP-linked respiration are we only seeing effects in men, you know, and could this, you know, potentially be related to hormones? Um, and so we, did, you know, we have a lot of hormone data on these subjects. And so we looked at the estrogens that we collected. And what we found was that, you know, when looking at estrone, so estrone, so keeping in mind, these are postmenopausal women, um, estrone is converted to estradiol. And with the depletion of ovarian hormones, estrone actually becomes the primary estrogen in postmenopausal women. And like, you know, I mentioned in the beginning, um, estradiol enhances mitochondrial efficiency by upregulating the protein expression of different metabolic enzymes, including ATP synthase, which converts ADP to ATP. So it's really nice to see that, you know, higher estrone levels are related to increased ATP uh, linked respiration, which in turn, as I just demonstrated uh, in women was related to better me memory performance as well as um, a higher memory circuitry function. Um, and then, uh, and then, in you know, the final set of analyses, we looked at the other measures that we collected. Uh, so this includes my, uh, maximal respiration. So, um, in uh, again, we found very similar results when we looked at maximal respiration as well as spare capacity, where specifically in women. Um, higher uh, maximal and spare capacity were related to better uh, verbal memory as well as increased activity in the right hippocampus. So it was really nice to, you know, kind of see consistent results across the board and all of these measures of cellular respiration that we were looking at and, you know, also significant sex differences. Um, and, you know, these results also, you know, we're just starting to get into and look at, um, but to me, you know, these results suggest that um, women in early postmenopause may be more sensitive to lower bioenergetic states, um, especially under conditions when cells are stressed. So um, the regions that are involved, the brain regions that are involved in the memory circuitry, like the hippocampus, eventually the prefrontal cortex, are actually regions of the brain with high energy demands, and they're also the regions that are most vulnerable in Alzheimer's disease. And so, you know, these regions of high energy demand um, or sorry, postmenopausal women may have high energy requirements in order to sustain function, especially in these vulnerable regions. So um, to summarize these results, you know, we do indeed see that, you know, higher mitochondrial function is indeed related to better memory circuitry with greater effects in postmenopausal women compared to men. Um, and the hormone data uh, seems to suggest that, you know, maintaining estrogenicity in postmenopause may be particularly important. And, uh, and overall, you know, maintaining healthy mitochondrial function may be a potential therapeutic avenue for risk reduction in the face of high genetic and clinical risk, as the, uh, the amyloid data suggests. And um, yeah, so I'm 
I hope I left yes, okay, okay. Was some time for questions. So um so just you know in the final, uh, I just want to say a big thank you to uh, my mentor, Dr. Jill Goldstein, um, and our lab members and our collaborators at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, especially Dr. Tanisha Chitnis, um, Rohit Patel, and Rishi Lakanda, who oversaw the uh the cellular respiration analyses. Um, and then also, you know, our collaborators at the McCann Center, of course, Dr. Tansy, Dr. Rosand, uh, Dr. Pokopenko. Um, who helps with a lot of the, the genetic and all, uh, component of our study. Um, yeah, and I look forward to kind of continuing our collaboration with the McCann Center with the Hatch 2 study. Um, and if people are interested in learning more about, you know, the work that we do, um, these are our websites. Um, IconX is uh, Dr. Goldstein's initiative. It's the um, Innovation Center on Sex Differences in Medicine, in which the mission is really to develop, you know, sex selective diagnostic and therapeutics. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Komishi. Um, we have one question in the queue here from Dr. Kim. I don't know if Dr. Kim is, is here, would like to present that, but um, he's asking about the previous trials on hormone replacement therapy. And yes, that's a big area. <laughs> having the paradoxical effect uh, of making AD risk or, or uh, worsening the disease and whether you had any thoughts related to that trial and, and maybe in the bigger picture where, where you're headed in terms of the information that you're gathering and what type of interventions you may have in mind already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and definitely, you know, a big area of interest right now in terms of hormone replacement therapy. Um, I think, you know, really the more recent data is showing that it's all, it's all about timing. And, you know, um, the the hormone replacement therapy is actually ben is, is only beneficial really when it's administered in the early phases, even, you know, during perimenopause. Um, and then, you know, when you get too past, uh, when, you know, when you're too into menopause, um, there's actually uh, adverse effects. And so really the timing to administer more and more seems like, you know, it's during that perimenopause, early postmenopause um, phase where it could be beneficial. And uh, in terms of, you know, how I'm thinking about my research in terms of, you know, this, this therapeutic avenue, um, you know, uh, one of the, my research questions is to see, you know, like not everybody, not all women decline over menopause, you know, and who are the women who are declining? Who are those that are the most vulnerable? And really kind of teasing apart that variability. And one of my hypotheses is that actually women who, you know, prior to menopause have cardiometabolic disease, have type 2 diabetes, may be the ones who are most vulnerable, you know, going into menopause and may benefit most from, you know, metabolic treatments or, you know, therapies or, you know, therapies around mitochondrial function, which, you know, more and more there's, there people are starting to look at how to increase mitochondrial function. Um, and uh, certain populations may benefit more than others. Thank you. We have another question in the queue uh, from Dr. Z. Um, can you share your insights about the role of testosterone in addition to estrone in the sex differences of AD risk? It's a great question. We are just starting to get into testosterone. Um, I haven't personally looked very much at testosterone, but I have seen studies, you know, that have that have suggested that you know testosterone might be more beneficial in men as they go through andropause. But um, I think that's something definitely that you know we need to look into more. <laughs> we have this nice sample of men, and we do definitely have testosterone data. So um, I don't have any results on that right now, but um, I think that's something that we will look into. <laughs> The questions are coming through here. Uh, okay. Let's see, Ashley, go. Um, and please feel free to, to unmute and ask your question personally. Uh, that's also fine. Uh, but this one coming from Ashley is uh, yeah, amazingly important talk. Could you share your thoughts on the onset of menopause, premature versus late in relation to AD risk? Yes, that's great. So, that's, um, so yes, there's actually you know a lot of research coming out now on kind of the early menopause, uh, earlier age at menopause, and how uh, there's definitely you know um, some evidence to suggest that earlier age of menopause may increase your risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's a lot of uh, studies that have shown that you know surgical menopause definitely increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease, um, and so I think you know your your lifetime estrogen exposure um, is definitely important. Um, and early menopause can impact that. Thank you. Well, I, I have a, a couple questions. Uh, Rudy, okay. it looks like Rudy has a question. Go ahead, Rudy. Sorry, I don't need to. <laughs> just, a, just a quick um, 
First of all, that was an amazingly great talk. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. That was so well organized and so informational. And thank you for that. Um, but my question is, and this is kind of a nebulous question, but you know, we have a hundred or so different loci associated with Alzheimer's risk from GWAS. Mm -hmm. And some of those loci, you know what their gene is, some you don't know. There might be four, three or four or five genes in the locus that could be it. I wonder if there's any approach that you and 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 Dimitri and I and Jill could take where we take those G, those genes and maybe get some AI help and ask among these genes and these loci, um, which ones can be linked to potentially estradiol levels and you know, the, if you use estradiol as, as the linchpin uh, for estradiol levels, wh which one could be linked? Which ones could be linked to the sex differences in male versus uh, female risk in Alzheimer's disease? Because it's, you know, we've done some sex specific genetic analyses, but we really don't have a good handle on which genes explain the the, the um, sex difference. And I'm just wondering whether there's some way to take your data, the gene data. And again, I said this is nebulous, and then an AI approach to figure out which genes may matter in your pathways among the GWAS validated AD loci. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that would be amazing to do, <laughs> definitely. I know Dimitri was working kind of a sex specific polygenic risk score for, for Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, we would love to kind of, you know, apply that to our research as well to see, you know, how they relate to our outcome measures um, and the sex differences that we're seeing and definitely the hormone data as well. Um, but yeah, definitely would love to chat about yeah. that. <laughs> Let's have a, uh, and Jill said, why don't we have a little meeting about how to do that? Because um, maybe your data can help us sort out which genes are sex specific as well. So so just uh, I'll just add, aside from fantastic talk, Yoko, as usual, um, that um, one of the ways that we're approaching this is using uh, machine learning kinds of bioinformatics by, uh, so for example, we're transcribing monocytes and um, looking at uh, genes associated with, with immune function and the sex differences in that. Um, so Kyoko um, wasn't presenting those data, but it's an approach that we could use more generally. We're really interested specifically in immune, obviously you know this, but, um, in the uh, sex differences in immunity that may contribute really importantly to understanding these differences um, and this you know, by sex. Uh, and uh, genes are, you know, some of the genes you've, uh, you've identified uh, in your lab, Rudy, are really critical for that. So I think we could take machine learning approaches and we can even do some more specific hypothesis testing in genes you've already identified that I think could be really important. And we could look at it in, in, a, in a few different samples, not only in the biobank, but we have other samples that you could test it and we could do like a, an exploratory and then a in one sample and then a test in another, which would be fantastic. Yeah. Well, Dimitri's uh, turned his video on. Dimitri, any comments on this idea? Uh, yeah, so so first of all, with uh, regard to P sex specific PRS, I think uh, the problem which we were facing there is that most of the PRS with which we calculate, they are highly correlated with the apoe status. That was one of the reasons we were, uh, I think, working on that. And but uh, yeah, in general, I think it's it would be good to have a follow up conversation, and especially I would be interested in. Uh, in the ways you measure those. Uh, so what types of measures you have which would uh, identify those as estradiols and uh, like whether it's uh, quantitative or it's, or it's related just to the onset of menopause and uh, just to get a more understanding and then we can discuss how we can approach that. Yeah, and we have a new, we're putting, we're validating it now, but we have a new gene finding and Alzheimer's genome-wide finding from the analysis of the big, all of us in MG and uh, UK Biobank data sets that where mm -hmm. our best hypothesis is regulating estro estrogen levels, estradiol levels. So we can specifically talk about that too. So we should probably put a meeting together. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And um, androgens like testosterone, by the way, have anti-inflammatory effects. And so 
we think uh, that they may not only be important for men, but you know, obviously women produce you know or testosterone uh, as well, or weak androgens from the adrenal cortex. Um, Kyoko's done some really beautiful work as well in looking at what are some of the factors aside from estrone um, where um, that produce, um, continue to produce some estrogenicity in the brain. We don't want those of you who are menopausal, although I don't see anyone of that age on this call, but uh, those of you who are, it doesn't mean that we are going to be brain dead. I promise um, that there are ways that the brain actually produces other forms of, of estrogenicity that helps to maintain intact memory function, hopefully, since we live um, probably you know, in a range of menopause, we live so much longer after menopause. So um, really critical to, to, to identify what these factors are, um, like in the adrenal cortex produces weak androgen, dihydroepiandrostandione, which turns out the women that produce higher levels of DHEAS, this is a beautiful finding of Kyoko's, um, also, um, are better at maintaining intact memory function. So again, really looking for those alternative sources um, and other ways in which estradiol regulates systems like the immune system and enhancing that and so on. Mm -hmm. So also, yeah, separate from hormones, we also found similar effects with BDNF in postmenopausal women. So those postmenopausal women with higher levels of BDNF um, actually look more similar to kind of the premenopausal women. So. Definitely different ways of kind of, you know, maintaining that memory performance. <laughs> there, Kyoko, is hope. Uh, there is hope the, after menopause. Yeah. Well, Jill, <laughs> can I follow up on that hope? Because uh, I get these questions all the time mm -hmm. uh, from uh, women, perimenopausal and, and menopausal women. Um, and so, Kyoko, again, let me just add my congratulations. Beautiful talk. Thank you. Uh, is what, what should we, what advice should we be given, giving? Uh, at the present moment and time based on what the state of the science is. <clears throat> yeah, why, you, why, why don't you, I mean, you know, I can give my thoughts, but why don't you? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of the things <laughs> that, you know, the recommendations that, you know, even for that we're showing for Alzheimer's disease, like exercise, you know, diet, those kind of things, I think they will ultimately also help for the menopausal transition as well. You know, um, you know, one of the things that I'm going to, I'm looking into right now is, you know, what, you know, the state before you go into menopause, can that impact how you transition in terms of your cardiometabolic health? Um, and so, you know, that'll be interesting to see down the road, but I think, you know, things like exercise, definitely will benefit um that increases bdnf and that's right you no know, has a neuroprotective function um and so and then you know i don't like i don't want to say as a blanket statement hormone therapy you know is beneficial because for some people it could be detrimental in terms of depending on your your own medical history but you know uh early hormone therapy is definitely better um, then late. And so, you know, if you are considering going on hormone therapy to go on early in perimenopause. Um. Yeah, I, I'm going to underscore that because um, the problem is that physicians, you know, the HRT sort of had the kibosh put on it with the original Women's Health Initiative. Right. But in fact, the follow up, um, and Joanne Manson has said this herself, that she reanalyzed those data and found that the women that had been given, um, and this was all oral, and now it's there's trans transdermal patches and things like that, which don't get metabolized through the liver, which will have less of a side effect profile. But um, but the point is that the earlier that it was administered, the more positive effect it had on not only cognitive function but dementia later on in life. So so it's really timing is everything, as Kyoko said. And the earlier, if you can do this from a medical point of view, the earlier, the better. And as I said, the uh, route of administration is really important. Uh, the, the, there are alternative routes of, of administration that may have fewer side effects um, on the breast or, or um, the uterus. 
So I, I have a couple comments or questions, Kyoko. So I also enjoyed the presentation very much. Very nice balance of background and, and presenting of new results. Very exciting. Um, one question is around the design. And um, I liked how you had the low risk and the high risk. But then in the high risk, you had categories of hypertension, diabetes. Are these people that have been treated and the diabetes is managed well or is the hypertension managed well? Or, or how are you dealing with people being labeled with hypertension that are, have managed blood pressure well or, or the same for, for diabetes? Mm -hmm. So um, so these are uh, biobank curated variables. So, so these are, um, you know, the biobank looks at medical history, so diagno like coded diagnoses as well as medication history to, um, uh, to classify those with hypertension or type 2 diabetes and depression. Um, and uh, actually, you know, one of my, our um, CRCs just actually put out an abstract for this for the Mizell Day, um, looking at kind of, you know, the real-time measures of these. So looking at, you know, um, HbA1c levels and glucose and how they relate to the outcome measures, the cognitive outcome measures that we're looking at. And is it a better predictor than, you know, these variables that the biobank are curating that, like you said, they, you know, these people can be on medication and have controlled levels of hypertension and glucose and HbA1c. So, you know, are these real-time measures more accurate of amyloid pathology and, you know, cognitive performance? And sure enough, we did find, you know, that these real-time measures of HbA1c, you know, glucose, um, current, uh, we did a whole neuropsych assessment of um, psychiatric uh, history and uh, MDD, a major depression diagnosis. And those were more sensitive than the biobank yeah. curated variables. So, you know, that's to say, you know, there, there could be people in our low risk group who, you know, have diabetes or pre or pre diabetic and don't know it, um, or have hypertension and don't know it yet, um, because either they haven't seen a doctor recently or whatnot. So there's definitely a benefit to kind of getting this deep phenotyping data that we're getting right now in order to kind of hone um, and, you know, validate the, the clinical risk or to, I guess, improve this, you know, clinical risk algorithm that we ultimately want to create. Um, so, so my, thank you for that. So the follow-up question is around nutrition and mitochondrial function and micronutrients that are involved in ATP production. You know, so about over a decade ago, we identified um, a nutrient biomarker pattern that included a lot of these B vitamins, vitamin C, E, and D, mm -hmm. uh, protective in an observational study. That formula has been translated now into three clinical trials, which maybe you've heard about, uh, that have been successful in slowing cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. um, and the mechanism is unclear, and this relates to Dr. Kim's question, I think, in the queue as well. Um, we didn't understand at the time what these B vitamins and how they were having a role and so forth. And I'm wondering if you have any plans to look at brain nutrition or some of these factors. We know that the brain has a remarkable capacity to concentrate a lot of these nutrients similar to glucose um, mm -hmm. and whether or not this might have a causal role for depletion of some of these um, AD risk factors that you're identifying that might really have um, a nutritional um, background or something that could be modifiable. Have you yeah, definitely. I think nutrition and dietary intake um, is, you know, a, a huge area that would be of interest. Um, I haven't, you know, really explored that area, but I think down the road in terms of thinking of, you know, intervention methods and, uh, and again, um, all of this, I don't know if the study was done by, by sex or considering, you know, menopausal staging, but that might help, you know, kind of tease apart some of the, the findings and, you know, um, help kind of explain, you know, results a little bit. But I think definitely in women looking at, you know, it's really important to take into consideration uh, menopause because your metabolic state prior to menopause and your metabolic state after the menopause is very different mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, how your, your glucose metabolism and everything. So, um, yeah, I would definitely be interested in looking at that. <laughs> okay. And, and Dr. Kim, did we address your question? Oh, yeah, you can do okay. it. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so you want me to present it? Yeah, sure. That was uh, great. In the yeah, so uh, do who's who you see here uh, is. Oh, I can see it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, I'm happy okay. to address it. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, um, we actually are. So, um, you know, like I said, the reason we use monocytes is really because that's what was available, or PBMCs, that's what was available, you know, in the Hodge study. And so this was really kind of the initial, you know, analysis to try to see, you know, is there a relationship between peripheral measures of mitochondrial function? Um, and it just so happened that these were immune cells, but um, um, 
our collaborator, uh, Dr. Tanisha Chitness and her team are actually looking at, you know, how these seahorse measures, measures are then relating to immune function. Um, and so hopefully we'll have, you know, I'd be able to answer this question better uh, down the road, but we are definitely looking to see, you know, whether the mitochondrial function of the immune cells are impacting immune uh, profile, immune profiles of these subjects. And then ultimately, is that the way that it's kind of linking to the brain outcomes that we're looking at? So the reason I'm asking you is because there's another hypothesis that if you have more active hyperimmune cells in the woman, especially with the estrogen, the one possible hypothesis is the brain infiltration of T cells and other, it can be modulated. And then those may actually contribute some of the changes. I just to introduce Rudy and I and Maddie Joseph has a publication, Nature Neuroscience, how important paper immune cells in the brain disease model. So I'm actually wondering that if there's some correlation with these infiltration and woman and these conditions, it would be interesting. That's fair. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I have to admit, immune is really not my area. <laughs> so, but I mean, if definitely anyone's interested in chatting about that, you know, we would love to talk about it. But uh, yeah, my background's not in immune. So I don't know if Mehdi has thoughts. I know he's doing a lot of kind of the immune work uh, with the Hatch study as well. So um, Mehdi, I don't know if you have, if you'd be of interest to kind of look into that as well. But hmm. Okay, well, I think that concludes the session today. Uh, Dr. Konishi, thank you so much for the thank wonderful you. presentation <laughs> and taking the time. Thank you, everybody, for your attendance. We'll see you next time. Bye.